Howdy everyone. Today we are going to do the Radical Reformation. And let me first explain what the, I mean by that term, radical. Um, this is the Reformation that happened not underground necessarily, but grassroots. Um, the non-magisterial Reformation that was put in by ordinary people and it happened at the same time as the other Reformation. It's the story that's usually not as, uh, well, it's not there in the Western Civ texts <laughs> as, as often, uh, partly because these people are hunted down and marginalized and escape, really. Um, their story doesn't end up in Europe at all, as we will we'll see. Um, let's start with the, what the word radical means also. Um, we tend to think that radical means extremist or... Um, or, uh, I don't know, but the, the word itself actually mean, comes from the word Latin word root, radix. So it actually is the radish revolution. <laughs> the radish means root. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being silly, but, but in fact it's true. Uh, the word means to return to the roots of an idea or a, a movement or a concept. It's not innovation. It's not extreme innovation at all. In fact, the pretext of it is to return to the original intention of the roots of a movement, in this case Christianity. And I think where we have been sort of looking in the course of this Protestant Reformation um, is toward the logical conclusion that the Bible, the text of the book, would be the guide for everything, for all daily life, all activity, all um, communal decisions, everything that happens, both Old and New Testament. Um, and as we saw, neither really Lutheranism certainly didn't do that, and neither did really the Calvinist uh, churches. They tried, but they went quite far, but there were things that they didn't do. For example, um, there's nowhere really in the New Testament that it says if someone is a heretic, you punish them, but that's in fact exactly what um, Calvin and Geneva does to Michael Servetus, who is a very interesting um, radical reformer. I think we'll talk about him today. Um, also wrote a fascinating book on syrups. <laughs> I know that sounds unlikely, but he was a physician also. Um, they burned him at the stake for heresy. So you can see that the Magisterial Reformation not only, you know, squashes peasants, but it will declare people heretics and and, um, and push them out. And as you know, well, maybe you don't know this, is that the, uh, you know, Massachusetts Bay Colony did the same thing. They pushed out people. They pushed out um, Roger Williams, who ended up founding um, Rhode Island because he was too extreme. They pushed out uh, Anne Hutchins, who ended up wandering down the... The, uh, the the Hutchinson Parkway in uh, in um, New York State, but, but but the point is that they were not open and tolerant and accepting. They ended up being very um, well. They ended up persecuting the exact people we're going to talk about today, the radical reformers who wanted to push everything all the way back to the original original idea of Christianity, with none of the traditions added on, and um, and be mm -hmm. you know really evangelical about it. Now let me before we jump into the story itself, I want to tell you a couple of interesting things um, that are just sort of personal weird anecdotes, I guess, really. Um, one thing is I have known about these people, and actually probably you have too, my entire life. Um, where I grew up in New Jersey was kind of proximate to the what was called the Amish country in uh, Pennsylvania. It was maybe an hour, an hour and a half away or so. My parents loved the place, mostly for the food and for the tchotchkes. And so we used to go all the time. So it was kind of from the time I was an infant, we would go there, have dinner, go to antique shops and kitchen kettle and things like this. So I kind of knew about that culture without really knowing why the Amish were as they were. They're part of this story, okay? I know that sounds kind of strange, but the, the Amish who are in um, Lancaster County in Ohio and throughout the United States um, and several other radical groups end up in the United States. That's the only place they survive, okay? So I'll, I'll show you how that happens uh, in the course of this, but it's just weird that I've kind of always known them but never really understood the religious motivation for why they did what they did. And of course, that wasn't part of the tourism trade, you know? Um, the other interesting thing is this is actually the first lecture I ever gave. Um, when I was in grad school at Columbia, my um, advisor said, would you like to do this one lecture? <laughs> I was like, you got it, okay. And so I had myself a, um, a class of Western Civ in, um, you know, of mostly freshmen, I guess, at Columbia. So I gave this, like, the first proper lecture I ever gave. So it's kind of fun for me to return to it, um, you know, having... Um, studied it of course but it was it's kind of interesting that I still do it um but let me let me make one other weird kind of um uh 
observation, which is kind of strange. When we think of political systems, we tend to think of them as the moderates in the middle, and then a far right, and this is my right hand, right? And a far left, and that the far right and left are kind of opposite sides of the spectrum. You have the far right fascists, you have the far left communists, right? I mean, the extremes of both um, you know, the Republicans, the Democrats, they meet somewhere in the middle, but as you get to the end edges, you have Bernie on this side and God knows who on the other side, okay? Um, we tend to think that they're, they're polar opposites, but in fact, they end up governing in ways that are weirdly similar, um, meaning that the, you know, communist states of, um, you know, the mid-20th century were surprisingly similar to the fascists in the way that they dealt with things and their sort of control of society. Now that's that's not my you know unique observation, but I want to apply it to this, because strangely the vigor and the sort of understanding of religion in practice and in theology also at the very extremes, the extreme right I'm comparing I guess to the Catholic Church, which returns to its traditions, we'll see in the next lecture, reinforces the sacraments and the works and all those things. The complete opposite side, the far, far, far left, this radical reformation, um, strangely enough, starts emphasizing the works again. So theologically, they're actually very different from the Calvinists. And theologically, they're different in a way that, um, think of the way that Calvinism was kind of elitist, right? Is the people who got saved were the ones who were doing well and successful and godly, God-fearing, and that was sort of a sign of their election, and they thought only a few people are elected, and those are the ones who are going to go to heaven in the end. The extreme radicals, on the other hand, believed that there was a, well, C Christopher Hill, the um, in British historian, called it a democratization of grace meaning grace was available to everyone, not just a select few elite saints, but in fact, everyone are saints. And, and they got that idea, of course, from the text of the Bible itself. But their interpretation of that meant that they could do good things, that they could work for their salvation. So weirdly, they're, they, they, they still have this sort of attitude, if not directly free will. It's not the predestination where only a certain group of people are saved and everyone else is damned. They believe grace is available to everyone, and especially the poor, lowly, the people who are marginalized by Calvinism, really, right? So, so you'll see that uh, this is a kind of radical, it's a religion for the poor and downtrodden and marginalized, very much like Christianity was at the very start, right? I mean, that's, that's who it appealed to from the start. So, so let's imagine the demand on the part of the um, initial reformers, people like Luther and Zwingli, and those people who put the word of the of God into vernacular, handed it to ordinary people, and said, "Okay, this is the. Um, I want you to think of the possi great possibility for heterodoxy, for lots of ideas to come out of that." And the at least Luther said, "No, you have to believe what the." the bishops decide, and it's handed down. The other churches said, well, you have to just believe what the synods have decided, and it may be bottom-up, but it's certainly not every individual deciding for themselves. So the, you know, probability that someone, an individual reading it and saying, you interpret this, no one, no one is letting them do that, they're doing it, and um, finding that the standard magisterial reformation solutions don't actually match the text. That if the text is the authority, they're not fulfilling it. They're not going the whole, you know, nine yards. They're not um, doing everything. They're doing the things that are convenient for them. And of course, they're still wealthy and they're powerful and they're, it's still the powerful people in control, right? So the cities and the state, regional states that are putting in these reformations, what would happen if we let ordinary people um, put it in themselves? Um, and we know that Luther's, th this doctrine of sola scriptura, did not implement every single law found in the Bible. Uh, and in fact, the New Testament, as we know, you know, sort of releases us from fulfillment of many of those laws. But, um, but how about the other things, you know, the things that are, um, that are not clear or that have many different texts that say different things, or if something in the New Testament doesn't say it about this topic, you go back to the Old Testament, right? Um, and as we know, you know, Zwingli 
was somewhat more in thorough, uh, thorough about implementing the Bible as a guide to church practice and moral life, um, not just in, in the iconoclasm, you know, smashing idols and things, but actually imitating Christ's uh, life. Um, and, um, you know, the sort of being humble and forgiving and practicing what, what were considered Christ-like virtues. So that was, you know, closer in many respects. But he didn't recommend, for example, that we give up our property and wander around begging, you know, or, um, or live, you know, only according to the word. And, um, and he didn't take every commandment literally, right? I mean, we, we know that. Um, and in fact, you know, the Zwingli reserved his right to dispense an official interpretation of the Bible, of course, that he decided. And so this is, this is what we're going to believe. Don't everyone just make up your own mind on this. Not, it's not individual freedom to, to interpret. Um, but allowing everyone to interpret the Bible as he or she pleases is letting every man go to hell in his own way. That's a quote from him. Okay, so so just just realize that this is a danger. But if you're going to say sola scriptura, where does that line get drawn? And, and for them, they drew it, you know, fairly fairly conservatively. But if you did take that book literally and believed as the book itself claims that the salvation can only be achieved by trusting that it is the inviolable word of God, what's going to happen? Obviously, you have something very different from the magisterial reformers, people who feel that Luther and Zwingli and ultimately Calvin had not gone far enough. Um, and these people were designated um, radical reformers. Okay, now I want you, want you to realize, well, I've kind of left them out of the story thus far to be for the sake of clarity, but the radical reformers appear almost instantaneously among Luther's followers. They're there, right as the, the very, from the very beginning. In fact, the man who took over uh, for Luther in Wittenberg in that moment when he was in exile, um, while well, he was you know, in uh, Wartburg in the early 1520s, this is Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, Karlstadt, K-A-R-L-S-T-A-D-T, um, performed, uh, did things that Luther would not have approved of. For, for example, he performed the Mass in regular clothes, saying, well, Jesus and his followers did not wear elaborate gold vestments and fur-lined things. They wore ordinary clothes, so we should do it too. Okay, that's a step in the in further direction. He offered communion in both kinds, meaning wine and bread, because that's what the book says to do, right? Uh, that's against a formal Lateran Council ruling of 1215. Um, they began heading toward this kind of biblical literalism as early as 1522, Karlstadt, um, in ways that we're familiar with, he's the first to say we shouldn't have images because thou shalt not bow down before graven images. Um, the idea that clerical celibacy was crazy before Luther even comes up with this. Okay, And Luther comes back to Wittenberg um, after his exile and says, hey, what are you doing to our church here? Get out. <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're, you're innovating. That's not what we intended. And not surprisingly, um, Karlstadt goes to... Um, Zurich for Zwingli and says, well, Zwingli's the one who's doing it right anyway. I'm going to go there. And Zwingli, you know, like, like Zwingli, Karlstadt believed that the mass was only really a reminder. There's no real, real presence of uh, flesh in the bread. And he quotes, you know, Matthew 26, 26, to, to be precise. This is what it reads. Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Um, and this, he believed, was to be taken as a parable, um, like much else that Jesus said. Um, uh, and moreover, what makes him thoroughly radical is because he's saying, you know, speaking metaphorically, we can, in fact, dispense entirely with the sacrament. He wasn't referring to a special ritual. He didn't say, get together and once every Sunday or a few times a year, eat this symbolic bread. And He was saying, every time you eat bread, every time you sit down to dinner and have a slice of bread, uh, remember me, this is my body. You're not being literal. He's saying, you know, you incorporate. He meant this entirely spiritually and metaphorically. Um, and therefore, we don't need the external sacrament because it doesn't say that in the in the text now that's a step 
totally, totally beyond what anyone else has said, anything like that. Um, and again, witness the potential danger here. If you let everyone interpret things as they want, you can, you, it can be a real mess, right? Um, Karlstadt was actually lucky enough to slip by without being persecuted with other radicals, but the, in the coming years, the other ones would not be as, um, as lucky. And the ideas are still there, and they begin to surface again. Um, I said I'd mentioned the, the German Peasants War of 1540, uh, 1524 to 25. I'm going to go into that just a little bit more, particularly because there was one fanatical preacher who appears in the midst of all these violent upheavals um, with, with the people who were called Bunshu. That, it's, they had shoes. That was their, their uh, sort of a modern, not motto, their, uh, sem, their mascot, I don't know. Um, but this is Thomas Munzer. Okay, now don't be confused by the names. You know, some of them sound similar, but this is Thomas M-U-N-Z-E-R, Munzer, um, who preached not only... Um, to abandon Catholicism, which of course Luther had to, but abandon Lutheranism, of, of abandon the you know magisterial things being opposed that kind of look still a lot like Catholicism, and apparently he had these mystical visions that he thought he should should um, lead the peasants in a holy war against the ungodly. Okay, so this is so so there's kind of there's a violent side to to these movements also. He said, do not let the blood dry on your so swords, but slaughter all godless rulers. Now, this, this is not like, you know, Geneva breaking away from the Duke of Savoy, which is a political revolution. This is a social revolution. It's coming from the bottom up. It's coming from ordinary people saying, go kill your landlords. Um, go kill anyone who's ungodly. It's not a, an organized political rebellion at all. In fact, it's, it's, a, it's a real revolt. Okay. Um, and what he's talking about is Munzer appears to have read the very last book of the Bible very closely and took it very seriously. And he believed that what was happening, you could see everywhere, was the second coming, the apocalypse. Okay? And, and I mention that because it's there in earlier thought. I mean, it's there in medieval throughout the Middle Ages. But at various times when things go wrong, like, for example, when the plague hit, People said, oh, well, you know, the four horsemen are on the horizon. There'll be buckets of blood. The saints will be separated and, and there'll be, you know, the, so, so all of this stuff, very interesting mystical language they took to be real prophecy of what would happen when Christ would come down back to earth and rule as a king for a thousand years. Okay, we use the term millennial completely in the wrong meaning. We think it means every thousand years since Jesus was born. It, that's not what it means. It means that the, when he comes back, then the thousand years following will be the um, uh, the a thousand year period, and the earthly kings will crumble. Now, I want to read you just a little passage from um, the book of uh, John of Patmos' uh, Revelations because this is um, this is what they're thinking of. Uh, and when you hear the word "whore of Babylon," remember what they mean is the, they're thinking it's the Pope. Okay, so all nations have drunk deep of the fierce wine of her fornication. The kings of earth have committed fornication with her, and merchants of the world have grown rich on her bloated wealth. This is Revelation 18.3. Uh, Munzer also read that the entire earth, would, as we know it, would be destroyed, and only a select group of saints would remain. This was 12 times 12,000, so that we put that at 144,000 people. Um, and only those people would survive to live in this new kingdom, which would be a new Jerusalem. Okay, so when you hear that term, um, that, that's what they're meaning, this new thing, this new era that's going to be ushered in. And remember, we've had lots of different eras in the whole Judeo-Christian tradition. There's the Edenic era. There's the Pope, uh, you know, period after the flood. There's the period when the law was given to Moses. There's the Jesus, and this is supposed to be another, the second coming, okay, of, of Jesus. The That's what the apocalypse means. Um, and Munzer saw himself as the chosen instrument of God to bring about this, to personally take the sword in hand and slaughter the degenerate as uh, on the plains of Armageddon, is which, what, what he saw. Um, and, uh, you know, he was thinking the kings, the wealthy people, the people who are fixing a few things here and there in Lutheranism, but we need to enact it 
God is not going to do it for us. We need to, we are the instrument of his wrath and bringing about the second coming. You know, today, what would we call these people? Terrorists, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's, you know, if you're an official, you get to name someone that, but they were obviously, um, taking this very seriously. It wasn't just, just, you know, a social, uh, just not just a revolution to take people's money away from them, but, but a real belief that the second coming was about to happen. Um, and so Revelation was used, the book of Revelation was used as a pretext for um, social revolution, right? For, for overturning the wealthy. And, um, and of course, you know, Munster's visions um, led him to the conclusion that he was personally the dispenser of God's wrath. Um, and, and again, this is the danger of putting that Bible into everyone's hands. Um, Munzer's peasant army met the troops of the princes of Hesse, the Braunschweig of Saxony, um, and surprising, not surprisingly, they were absolutely crushed. This is 1525 at Frankenhausen. Uh, Munzer promised, as he ran into battle, that he would catch the enemy's bullets in his sleeves. And so he said, let's sing and march into battle. And of course, they mowed them down. They had bullets, remember? This is, this is right when, when that technology becomes very efficient. And, and, um, and so Munzer was captured that very day. He was actually beheaded there also. And the most fascinating thing about Munzer, and, and obviously this was a very quick you know, event. It's over but as soon as it happens, um, is that Karl Marx took him to be the very first kind of revolution, the first, first in a pattern that would unfold, of course, in, in ultimately what he believed would be the communist revolution. Um, but, but Munzer was a hero for Marx, very interestingly. He, he said that this was the first sign of the peasants finally saying, we've had enough, and the burgeoning of what would be a capitalist system um, in the wake of this, this was the first of many real um, social revolutions. And he pointed to the English revolutions, and we pointed, of course, to the French revolution, and then ultimately to the communist one. But but he thought Munzer lit that fire. Isn't that interesting? That just just uh, strange. Um, as, um, a proto-Marxist kind of foreshadowing the revolution of workers against their oppressive overlords, I guess. But um, anyway, as you know, the, um, you know, the Peasants' War was put down entirely violently um, and that was just the first of many, many cases where the radical dissenters would be uh, squashed. Um, and uh, this one uh, disappeared without a legacy. We'll see the others um, survive in, in very interesting ways. So the next group we'll discuss are a little different. They are called Anabaptists. And in fact, I could have called this whole lecture, some people do use that term very broadly, to mean um, it, to, well, to start with, the word Anabaptist means to re-baptize. And of course, this first generation of people had been baptized into the Catholic Church, so they were re-baptizing. And the one question is, of course, why are they doing that? Um, they were thinking that the original baptism of Jesus happened when he was an adult. It was a sign of willingful acceptance into the Church of its beliefs and something an infant could not do. So they thought, if we're going to do baptism, it has to be the way it actually is in the Bible, the way the way adult, where adults were baptized, and that was always the case. Um, and uh, according to the you know official uh, Protestants, to rebaptize is a sin. You're only allowed to be baptized once. So the um, and in fact they get this out of the Justinian Code. Weirdly enough, it's um, you know a death penalty. Uh, for rebaptizing people, in fact, um, because everyone was done in, in infancy. Now, the question is, why would why would they do that? Why would they start with infancy? And the the, I think the the fear was that if someone died, which of course very high infant mortality rate, they did, before being baptized, they would never. They would be, it would be impossible for them to ever get into heaven because you need that as a sacrament, right? Um, and so, and you would go into limbo, right? So the. Um, idea was if you baptize them very young, within a few days, then even if they die in infancy, there's a possibility they could go into heaven as being innocent. But if you waited till they were adults, no. And I think that's why they, they moved it to, um, but it's not biblical, right? It's not the way, not the original intention of that. Um, you know, John the Baptist baptized adults, and, and so did so did the early, early church, everyone. Um, and so again, the Anabaptists they get that name as a term of abuse. They don't call themselves that. And I can think that's why some scholars hesitate to use the word. And it's and it actually encompasses many, many different disparate movements. 
Um, but I just wanted to throw it out there uh, because it's it's a useful term, even though it's a, a term of abuse um, from the from the other side. Um, and uh, they actually called themselves brethren. And the, the reason that, that, as Jesus did his followers, right? Um, the reason that that becomes confusing is there are other groups called brethren that are really not Anabaptists. So, so let's just for the sake of convenience, let's use that. Um, and the Anabaptists essentially were another attempt to faithfully implement the Bible and use it as a guide to everyday life and take the words that Jesus spoke literally, if you love me, keep my commandments. Don't just do what you like and what's convenient and what's useful for the state. Do everything that I say. Um, and the first permanent Anabaptist movement, the one that survives, that happens actually right under the nose of Ulrich Zwingli, among his uh, people. These were three of his followers. There's Conrad Grebel, G-R-E-B-E-L, Felix Manz, M-A-N-Z, and Georg Blaurock, B-L-A-U-R-O-C-K. They um, were reading the Bible together, okay? These three guys. And they noticed that, well, Jesus was uh, baptized as an adult by John. It was clear that it was a sign of his belief, of cleansing of sin, of you know getting grace through washing, um, and that he freely chose to come and partake in this ritual that signified that he was in a society of believers. Right, that's that was what that meant. Now, again, an infant can't logically choose. Are we presuming that a baby will automatically come into the church and therefore ipso facto be a believer, which is kind of um, ridiculous in a way. Um, and it says, you know, Matthew very clearly says, he who believes is baptized and shall be saved. Not he who is born, everyone. It's believers. Um, and they took this to mean that it should only be adults. Um, and... Uh, and of course, they have to get rid um, of this idea that uh, an infant who is unbaptized is automatically never going to get into heaven. There'll be a limbo, um, and so they and they kind of get rid of this idea. Well, the whole idea of purgatory really isn't in there. That happens down the road, and in fact, even the idea of original sin is not really in there. This assumption that everyone's sinful until they receive the baptism and other sacraments, and then they can be saved. They said infants are completely innocent at birth. They're, they're not good or evil. They're, they're you know, they're, they're nothing. They're, they're innocent. And, and to assume that they're, they're, they've inherited this sinfulness from, from Adam and Eve is, is ridiculous. So, um, and so I have something here. Let me read a little passage for you. Is, uh, this is a letter from Grable to Munzer. We conclude from the description of baptism and from accounts of it, according to which no child was baptized, that's in the, in the Bible itself, that infant baptism is a senseless, blasphemous abomination contrary to all scripture. So they're throwing it down. And this, of course, separates them from all other Christian sects. Every single one is, they're separate from. Uh, so, that, so they um, baptize each other. Um, of course, it's a rebaptism because they've all been baptized before. But these, this is called the birthday of Anabaptism. It's January 21st, 1525. Um, and it technically becomes a separate religion, separate sect, let's say, within Christianity right at that moment. Okay? Now, what becomes of these guys, exactly what will happen to so many other Anabaptists, um, people who take the injunction that if someone hits you, you turn the other cheek. Well, what if you took that literally? You would offer no resistance to those who persecuted you. You would not even necessarily try to escape. You'd, um, you know, um, because it's, he says, ye shall be persecuted, killed, and dispersed for my name's sake. So a lot of these people become martyrs. Um, I don't say willingly, of course, no one willingly becomes a martyr, but they, but they accept that, and they accept that they're going to be persecuted, and that, like the early Christians, that's the way they will survive, is through um, standing for, the, not just their beliefs, standing for the truth, for the book itself, and not these other innovations. Um, so, Grable himself, is sort of the beginner of all this, um, was lucky, lucky enough, I say, but he died of plague before they could um, capture him and persecute him. Um, I don't remember the year of that, but it's, um, it's some point in the 1520s. 
uh, Mance was captured, tied up, and thrown into a lake. Now, think of the re horrible, cruel irony of this. They said, haha, you're a Baptist, we're going to rebaptize you again. And he obviously drowned in the lake. Um, and Blaurach was um, burned in 1529. So, so this, 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 they are martyred, right? Um, and this will become a recurring pattern. Um, the movement spreads to southern Germany after this. Another group of Anabaptists springs up in the 1520s, in 1527 or so, and they decide to have a synod in the town of Augsburg, and they get together and. Um, and if posterity remembers this synod um, with the name the Martyrs Synod because of what happened to them. This is Balthazar Hubmeier, H-U-B-M-A-I-E-R, um, ended up uh, presiding eventually over a community in Moravia. Um, and eventually he was turned over to the Austrian authorities, burned at the stake as a heretic. Um, and then Hans Denk, Denk was a, a D-E-N-C-K, um, was a kind of witty theologian, um, he uh, uh, said of baptism, there's no point in washing carrots while they're still growing in the dirt, which is kind of, I don't know, very funny, I think. Um, he also died of plague in Basel. So so these none of these people, even though they you know were organized, um, they, they all get uh, um, hunted down. And then the last of these guys, Hans Hutt, H-U-T, um, who had actually taken part in the war with Munzer, you know, back with, with uh, in the um, Luth in Germany? Um, it was said that he was captured, um, managed to burn himself in prison. Now, now, of course, you're not supposed to do that within Christianity, but um, but his charred remains were taken out of the church, uh, put to stand trial in court, and then condemned for heresy. And so, this whole first generation of Anabaptist leaders is wiped out um, viol really violently. Um, now, surprisingly, despite all this persecution, the Anabaptists do manage to begin practicing a kind of primitive Christianity as they uh, conceived it, exactly as, as you know, described in the New Testament, and they eventually even write up their own statement of belief. And it is still kind of the, the cornerstone document of the, that draws all these disparate movements together. It's called the Schleitheim Confession. And yes, I'll spell that for you. S-C-H-L-E-I-T-H-E-I-M. That's a, a 1527 written by a guy, uh, Michael Sattler. Okay? I wouldn't call him, he's not among the extremists of these people, but um, yeah, Sattler was, wrote this thing. Um, and the idea was to clarify their images, I think sometimes to disassociate them from the real, you know, fringes. And, um, and so, for example, they, the Schleitheim Convention, uh, Confession condemns antinomians, people who believe, contended that if only faith gets us saved, then there's no such thing as sin. The, the, the people who have faith will go into heaven and everything else is just a word, a name that we call um, blasphemy or gluttony or all those things that are, they're, they're all made up by humans. So we'll come back to antinomians. That antinomian means not, it's just a name, <laughs> right? Um, and Sattler says, we're not those people. We don't believe sinning is okay or it doesn't exist. Um, I'll, I'll come back to what that means in a, in a bit. Um, but the Anabaptists are, interestingly, more concerned with godly behavior than anything else, right? Um, and this is how they read the Bible and put it into practice. And we'll see it's, it is totally different than, than the Calvinists and Lutherans. <clears throat> For one, the one thing that separates them, of course, is adult baptism only. Uh, that's the central tenet. It distinguishes them from every other um, sect. They also looked in the Bible and said, there's nowhere that we should persecute people who believe differently than us or people who were led into error. There's no such thing as heresy in the Bible. Um, and it doesn't say anything at all in the New Testament. So um, they look at the Old Testament and they say, well, there is a way that the community dealt with people who um, misbehaved or, or had errant beliefs or whatever, is rather than persecuted them, persecute them, they put the ban on them. Okay, now what a ban means is you're not physically harming the person, but you're 
ignoring them, basically. <laughs> you're keeping them in the community, but you're not talking to that, those people until they come around, until they understand the error of their ways. So it can, of course, be very, you know, um, mentally persecuted <laughs> in a weird way, but it meant that people, or sometimes it's called shunning. It means that you keep the people in the community for nonconformity, um, and if they don't eventually come around, you um, ask them to leave the group. You don't, you don't persecute them, okay? So the, the part of this that's very interesting, of course, is that they're going to be around all sorts of other people all the time. How do you keep this distinctive community, and how do you ban or shun people and push them out if they, they really um, you know, refuse to, to go along? is um, they live in, they're separatists. They live in separate communities. Um, and often this will mean physically going outside of a city into a rural area, building a new village, um, having, you know, the, the point is that they, they say we should not ever become civil magistrates. We shouldn't ever make use of civil law because that is part of the corrupt authority, the magisterial reformation. And um, we don't want any part of it. Is we must separate ourselves from the abomination, and that's that comes right from the the text of the Bible, uh, as Christ said. Um, and uh, so they form them, themselves into small separatist communities that are weirdly. And I want you to put these two things in just in conjun in proximity in your mind. Although this is not where they get their inspiration, but think of the think of you Thomas More's Utopia. And think of the utopian experiments, separate communities where people can live righteously. The Anabaptists are the ones who, ironically and weirdly, are actually putting that into practice. They, they, have, they build more or less communes where they live um, not to be corrupted by the, the worldly other people. Um, let me read you a little passage from this. This is um, from Hillebrand. This is, uh, this is right from the Schleidheim Confession. Sorry. We are agreed as follows on separation. A separation shall be made from the evil and the wickedness which the devil planted in, the, in this world. In this manner, <coughs> sorry, um, simply we shall not have fellowship with them. The wicked not run with them in the multitude of their abominations. And in the way, since all who do not walk in the obedience of faith have not united themselves. You, you get the idea. They're separate. It's okay. Okay. Um, Creatures um, are in but two classes, good and bad, believing and unbelieving, darkness and light, the world and those who have come out of the world, God's temple, Christ and Belial, none can have any part with the other. And so they, they leave, <laughs> physically leave, um, and form separate communities. Um, I'm going to say that's, that's kind of a distinctive feature of most Anabaptist sects. They also, number three, believe... Um, like other Protestants, that there is no sacrament or sacrifice warranted in the communion, sharing of bread. Nowhere does it say that it has to be a consecrated wafer. And those were these little sort of waffle, like waffles to the descendant of them, oddly enough. I know wafers nowadays are flavorless and whatever, but they, I think they probably must have been very good at once. But they, um, but I think they're, you know, if they had been thinking really historically, they probably should have had matzah. They should have had Passover matzah, of course. But they said, ordinary bread is fine. What Jesus meant at the Last Supper was that when you eat bread, remember me. And so they have, it's not really a, a sacrament, but they, but they do use ordinary bread in a kind of symbolic communion. Okay, And that's also very different. Um, and I think the logic of this was remind everyone that nothing magical is happening. It's a, it's a memorial, it's spiritually valuable, but it's not a real, there's no real presence. So, so why not just have ordinary bread? Number five, um, or did I forget number four? I don't know. Uh, well, the next one, uh, Christ commanded people to spread the word, not just sit at home and be good, but... Um, but to go out among people and preach and get consciously get converts and read from the Bible, set up reading groups, what they called conventicles, um, and that this wasn't just a separatist movement where they were going to put up themselves behind a wall and say, we're done, everyone else stay out. That, in fact, ends up happening down the road. But, their, but missionary effort is, was part of their logic because it, because it says, you know, Christ commands that at some point. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's, um, and most importantly, I think, 
is, is that Jesus said, any place where people gather in my name is a church. So they say, why do we have physical buildings, big, beautiful you know, monuments to the wealth of the, the organization? We don't need that organization at all. That's completely, completely corrupt. We can meet anywhere, meet in people's houses. That's better to remind everyone that sort of the worship is something you do all the time in your daily life. It's not just showing up in a church on one day a week and being good and then going back to your other, you know, your other life. Um, so I think they do that uh, partly to prevent being persecuted. Of course, they'll meet in the woods or they'll meet in a private house, but that becomes the pattern for most Anabaptist sects is there is no physical building of a church. Um, and what is most compelling, and I think the thing that really to this day separates Anabaptists and a, a few other sects is if you look at Jesus's words, um, if you take even thou shalt not kill, literally, it does not say kill if the person is a heretic, kill if your government commands you to in a war, kill if the person is a criminal and deserves to die. It says thou shalt not kill. It meant always. Okay? They take that literally. And they also take literally the idea that if someone strikes you, turn the other cheek. They read these texts to their logical pacifist conclusions um, and say it said basically all these theories of just war, which they came up with in the Middle Ages, were just a way for people to go on killing and raping and pillaging each other. It, true Christians should be pacifist, as Jesus himself was. And so they disavow all violence entirely um, and um, you know it clearly says thou shalt not kill <laughs> doesn't make exceptions um, and so, so uh, Anabaptists and, and a few similar movements we'll, I'll talk about in the end um, end up being um, radical pacifists so lastly the, this is and this commandment is kind of very interesting to me is the, the commandment thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain meaning I shouldn't say I swear meaning I swear by God I will give you this money back there's no way you can guarantee that and there's no way you can compel God to punish you if you don't do it because that's really what swearing means I swear meaning uh, since you there's no way you can compel me to give that money back let God do it and I'm I'm calling upon him to, to do so. Um, but it says, um, you know, uh, a swearing, maybe just to be clarify, it means by God, I swear I will do this or this shall happen. And that gives us, a, that pretends to have some kind of power over God that of course we don't have. Um, and the way this ex is logically um, played out, it doesn't mean swearing for prof the fact of profanity. It means making promises you, you cannot keep, but it also means you can't take an oath because an oath is actually exactly the same thing. I swear that I'm telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You put your hand on the Bible. And what is actually happening there is you're saying, if I am lying, may God punish me. Again, God makes those decisions. You don't make those. So swearing is a kind of blasphemy. Um, and um, so an Anabaptist cannot testify in court um, and um, or make legal contracts or be or partake, you know, in the civil government. Think, think of what a, a, a far turn this has been in just a generation from that active civic humanism, participation in government, Republican v virtues to saying, to hell with it. We don't want any part of this. We're going to separate and have nothing to do with your law or your government or anything. We're, we're going to live on our, by ourselves righteously. It's really a long, when you could see that thread that, that goes from there to there. So, so as far as this confession goes, um, there are um, a number of other theological points that come to be associated with Anabaptists. And their, their you know, concern was overwhelmingly, how do we make a perfect society on earth? That's been a question that we've been, you know, question we've been talking about throughout the course. Is how, but in this case, how do we live according to God's commandments? They believed that no one would be compelled to do that if God wasn't really bothered by our sins. In other words, they thought he is bothered, uh, you know, and if all we really, all that was really important was faith, then why all this, these practical admonitions throughout the Bible? Why does it tell us to do various things and not other things? 
And if anyone can believe, and they, they decide that, then we do have free will to turn toward God or turn away. So think about what I said at the beginning. This makes them similar, more similar to Catholics. The works are important. In fact, their detractors, the Calvinists, call them work saints, meaning that they think doing good deeds is actually what God wants us to do. It does get us credit. It's not just faith alone. We have free will. We can turn toward God or we can turn away from him. We can become like angels or like insects. Remember Pico? <laughs> Pico della Mirandola? Way, way back when. Um, which means that all people can be saved. This is universal salvation. It's totally, totally different from Calvin. Um, and the possible perfectibility of humans. That's, that's where this comes to. Um, so theologically, they are completely opposite ends of the spectrum from other Protestants. Salvation is not by faith alone. There is no predestination, um, and anyone can be saved. Um, again, the oligarchy of grace was now democratized, as Christopher Hill put it. Um, and what, it, what it, you know, effect, the effect that this had is Anabaptists are deeply concerned with doing good deeds, with um, uh, being work saints. Actually, Luther made that term up, I think, uh, calling them work saints. The, the other thing which is really, really surprising to me, and I just, I sort of know about this peripherally, but I need to read the texts. Um, they're all in a inscrutable 16th century German, which is really hard to read, but it's, um, but they often will become ascetics also, which is really, really strange to me. And, um, you know, in that they're, return, they're doing things that medieval Catholics, did, you know, Christians did, um, because I think it's going to get them credit. Um, and I have to find more about that. So anyway, just leave it at, leave it at that. But works count. Um, so what becomes of the Anabaptists? 1530s, the movement spreads beyond Switzerland, the southern German area, and takes some very interesting forms. Let me talk about these later, um, slightly later versions. Um, Melchior Hoffman, H-O-F-M-A-N, ends up in the city of Emden, in 1530, in the midst of a plague and famines and a series of floods, there's a war. I mean, it, it's nasty time. And he interprets this as an eschatological, eschatology means think, uh, thought about the end of times. He takes this as a sign of the second coming and he gathers around a community of saints who sign a contract kind of thing, or actually let's let's call it a covenant. It's, it's a little different thing. Contract is between individuals. A covenant is between you and God. Um, in, in, it's a it's a bondgenoten in in Emden's in, in the Netherlands, by the way. Um, so a bondgenoten is like a a bond note. I guess that's how you translate it literally. But it's a covenant to resist the. Um, um, world as it crumbles around them and they said let's join together and let everything go to pot and we will survive um, and there's a strange kind of ecstatic energy in the air at the time the Anabaptists start preaching from the rooftops um, they start uh, taking Jesus's command to behave like little children literally uh, and which sounds very silly but this was their motivation um, and in Amsterdam in order to preach the naked truth of God, and they get us out of Isaiah, they start running through the streets naked. Um, Amsterdam is the kind of place where I guess you can get away with that now. <laughs> so naked and smoking pot and looking for prostitutes, I guess. But 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 this frightens people to no end. Um, and the, uh, you know, Hoffman himself gets in prison very quickly for doing this. Uh, he died in prison just a, you know, a decade later. But, um, but the people who followed him are called Melchiorites, Melchior Hoffman, and they survive um, despite all of this. But one, but I, I mentioned Hoffman as a, a prelude to one of the strangest stories in all of history, one of the oddest that I can speak of, um, that takes place in the town of Munster, uh, M-U-N-S-T-E-R, that's in northern Germany. It's right adjacent to sort of the Netherlands. Just don't get that name confused with Munster. This is Munster. Okay? Um, Munster was an independent city. 
it had its own bishop, it had its own feudal overlord for the area, um, and by this point, Lutherans were in control of the city council, as happened in much of northern Germany. The Melchiorites started coming over the border out of the Netherlands. This is the early 1530s. And in 1533, this man appeared um, as a self-proclaimed Anabaptist prophet. His name was Jan Buckels or Buckelson, um, B-E-U-C-K-E-L-S. He was a tailor from Leiden. So you can see the sort of social roots of this, this movement. It was, um, and this other guy was a baker from Harlem. His name was Jan Matthijs. Okay, so these two, two guys show up claiming that they are, um, the end of the world is happening, this whole apocalyptic furor, and, um, and people believe them to such an extent that they put them in charge of the city council. So this is a political takeover, not just a, uh, you know, a, a uh, you know, separatist movement. And then they decide it is time to initiate the kingdom of Christ on earth. They begin by forcefully, and notice this is where it takes an interesting turn, forcefully rebaptizing everyone in the city. Anyone who was refused was cast out. And this actually happens in the winter. So it was snowing and they, you know, pushed people outside the city walls for resisting. Um, and the, while all of this is happening, of course, the bishop is not going to let this go by. They call troops and they are the troops are gathered around the city walls and they start chucking people out who, who won't go along with what they do. So you can imagine most people are like, yes, okay, we'll, we'll get baptized. We'll do whatever you say. Um, and a lot of people really believe this. So... They said, um, well, <clears throat> we look in the Bible, and Jesus did not have any property. In fact, he said, give away all of your property, um, abolish all private property. And so they instituted the first example I can think of in actuality of communism. Um, in fact, there's stories of people taking the, they ripping the locks off of doors. So all property was common, and they thought this is... In order for the second coming to happen, we have to initiate an, imi an exact imitation of what would have been the case in, among Jesus and his followers. Um, uh, books of the Bible, um, all books but the Bible were confiscated and burned. So you can see this is just sort of taking a very strange turn um, and obviously it's going to shock the rest of Europe. Um, the bishop says, okay, we're, we're just going to sit this out. Let's starve them. We'll take the city back by force. Um, and, and essentially, Matthijs becomes the dictator of the city, apparently upon the order of God. Um, he um, rushed out to uh, confront the troops of the bishop, and they killed him immediately, right? Um, uh, he thought him, he was invulnerable, and so he rushed out. So Matthijs is, is out of this whole thing. And the only person left is Jan Buckels, uh, or Buckelson, who's the, um, um, was called, or Jan of Leiden is sometimes what he's called also, was left there and said, okay, this is, this is all the prophecy unfolding. I now proclaim myself king of Zion. So you can see what's, what's happening here. Um, the, um, you know, he says this is time for a proper Old Testament monarchy, um, which, and everything that's in the Old Testament, we have to follow, um, unless it's been abrogated, so we can have not just, um, we can have polygamy, because, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, he took for himself several wives, <laughs> so, um, and began to think of himself as, a, as the instrument of God, and if someone disagrees, we slaughter them. Now, clearly, he's not taking the pacifism side of this too seriously, but he thought, at some point that the saints would be separated the holy from the unholy and that would initiate the second coming and so he again thinks he's that's his job to do this um and again i want you to think compare this again to you more's utopia where there is no property i don't think he ever read anything like that remember it was in in latin but but um i don't think it'd been translated into english until till the 15th very, actually very close to this, but anyway, he didn't read English anyway. So 1535, the bishop's troops finally uh, build up enough strength. Uh, they get reinforcements from Hesse. Um, they eventually storm the walls of this, retake the city. It had been weakened by starvation. Nothing was coming in and out for all this time. 
and a ferocious persecution followed. Um, all the Anabaptists there, the real believers, were put to the sword. Uh, Yan and his um, right-hand man were put into a cage and hung from the steeple of St. Lambert's and left there permanently. If you go to Munster, uh, Munster, the cage is still hanging up there. In fact, go, go, Google a picture of the Cathedral of Munster. You can see the cage where his bones were, I guess, rotted and disappeared and blew away, but he was never let down uh, from that position, just so everyone could see, you know, what was happening. And, you know, I always think when this was happening, I always reminded of um, Waco, Texas. Remember the Branch Davidians had this, this uh, compound and um, the federal government said, you can't exist. <laughs> and they came in and they just, they killed everyone, you know. Um, they claim by accident, but it was um, stra they're strangely similar, right? They would rather destroy all the people rather than bring them back into the fold or do whatever, you know. Um, uh, so anyway, Munster was completely, utterly re-Catholicized with the, with the troops of the, the bishop. Um, the entire Anabaptist movement got this bad name by association with, with uh, this weird incident, um, and everywhere that term becomes um, uh, a term of abuse and hatred is that that you know lutherans and calvinists persecute anabaptists after all of this so how do they survive they do some sects um will tone down their rhetoric tone down their uh, certainly take out the violent part of everything and particularly in the netherlands there was one um theologian who um made Anabaptism respectable again. His name is Menno Simons. The name Mennonite comes from him. Okay? Um, the Mennonites are the are one branch of Anabaptism that survive um, in Pennsylvania mostly, um, who apart from adult baptism and pacifism and no oaths and practicing the ban, um, they're not really, really that terribly different from uh, the Dutch Reform. In other words, they, they live in communities with other people. Um, they're moderate in many ways, but they don't want to be, they try to be the legitimate branch of Anabaptism. They don't want to be associated with Munster. Um, and this group, again, their um, majority of their followers left. Um, uh, they moved from the Netherlands into northern Germany. Um, and in the 18th century, they got out of there because they were, um, well, we'll talk about how Pennsylvania was founded, but they get invited and they just leave um, Germany and end up in um, mostly Lancaster County um, um, and through the Ohio Valley later on. But they're, and they're still there and, and they, they're a little different. They do have churches, um, they do, um, but, but the basic tenets of Anabaptism are still uh, intact. They still believe in the, um, in the uh, Schleitheim Confession, for example. Um, and the branch that you may be more familiar with is one group of the Mennonites breaking away from them. These are uh, the followers of Jacob Amman, um, who come to be called the Amish. Um, and one particular group of the Amish, the Old Order Amish, decide at one point in the 19th century, again with the logic of separating from the abomination, that they don't want the modern technological advances that came with the Industrial Revolution, again, 19th century in Pennsylvania. So they decide to only not to drive in cars or motorized vehicles, only horse-driven buggies and plows. They decide not to use electricity. They decide not to use gas lines or um, power or anything, and not even mass-manufactured clothes. They make their own clothes. They apparently don't put uh, buttons on them because that reminds them of the soldiers who are persecuting them. So the clothes are all pin closed, um, usually black cloak. Um, they wear beards as uh, once they get married, um, but not mustaches. So, they, so you, so you, that familiar black um, hat and long beard, um, and sometimes very interesting blue or very, very pastel-y like uh, shirts under a black cloak. Um, the Amish have a very distinctive look because they want to be separate. Um, and at least the old order um, is still basically, uh, there are exceptions, of course, that are still basically living in the 19th century. Now, what's, what's always fascinated me is that 
people often looked to them and said, well, they're still living that way. The food that they are growing is organic and pure and unfettered by, you know, modern, there's nothing, there's actually nothing that says they can't use modern fertilizers, but this is the perception among the, you know, people in the, um, on the East Coast is that somehow their food is closer to the pure food of the 19th century. So oddly, you know, there's a, there's a very, I shouldn't say oddly, but it's, it's interesting that this is very vibrant cuisine, which is essentially this 17th, 18th century German cuisine and including their language. They still speak this 17th century German. Um, and this cuisine is just transplanted right into, um, Pennsylvania and still lives there. And you, you, you'll often hear the word Pennsylvania Dutch. That's a slightly broader term that includes uh, Mennonites and Amish and, and regular Germans, Dutch meaning German. But the Amish have a very distinctive cuisine, certain uh, drying sweet corn, shoe fly pie. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of um, dishes which are wonderful, wonderful things, but that are kind of unique to that area. If you're ever there, go to one of the restaurants there. <laughs> they're, they're, they're fabulous. Um, so in any case, they still live in Pennsylvania through the Midwest. Um, uh, they still speak this German dialect. They still, and the names are all, you know, Stolzfuss and uh, Miller. And they're, they're all very German names still. And um, they only marry within the community. Um, they still practice pacifism. And if you don't go along with the, with the plan of the community, you are banned. They kick you out or, or, um, or ignore you. So it's it's a it's a very it's one of the few surviving separatist communities in the world that's based on you know these religious principles, um, um, and I think you know many people have seen the movie Witness I don't know um, know about them but they don't realize where they came from why they're there okay so let me talk about another branch of the Anabaptists these are the followers of Jakob Hutter um, that heads in a different direction the um, Hutterites, as they're called, or Moravian brethren. Um, Hutter um, himself was, was, you know, an early Anabaptist leader who died in uh, 1536, but his followers settled in what's now, now Moravia, which is the, the, you know, Czechia, the Czech Republic, um, and live in slightly different than, than the um, Amish because they live all in one big house, what's called a Bruderhof. Um, sort of like a utopian commune because they don't have private property there, um, but also weirdly like a monastery, except that they have families, right? They're, they're married and they have children and they live together communally in these big houses. They do communal farming. They or And sometimes, very interestingly, the, the Bruderhof, or the, the, the whole Hutterite communities, will become very industrious because they don't have private property. They're not concerned about buying houses and property and material goods. So they become these very industrious manufacturing communities that make clocks or furniture or pottery or um, machines very, very interestingly, even later when we get through the 19th century, and they become famous for this. Now, what happened to them is in the course of the Thirty Years' War, this is in the 17th century, the entire area where they lived, including um, the Czech Republic, was violently re-Catholicized. So this is when uh, the Czech Republic, Poland, Austria, all those Protestant movements are wiped out there. And the Hutterites are, of course, suspect along with them. And they are pushed in the opposite direction. <laughs> and then the, the Anabaptists, they go to Russia, interestingly. Um, they end up moving eastward and eastward. And then later they're pushed out of there. And the place they end up in in the 1870s is in South Dakota, in Canada, in Saskatchewan, that, that area just above, um, and they are still there. And they still live in, uh, not always, not really in Bruderhof, but they still are a surviving Anabaptist movement that only exists in the United States. Um, another group that seems to have had its origin, again, the same, around the same time as the 16th century Baptists, they end up in Poland with this guy called Fausto Socini. They're called Socinians as a result. Um, and very interesting theologically, like the Anabaptists, they reject original sin and predestination, um, and, but they go one step further. And I, this is the reason I want you to remember Socinus, um, Socini, as, as, as an Italian name, is they say, 
But if we're doing it only the Bible, we have to remember the doctrine of the Trinity was made up in the Council of Nicaea, 325. It's old, but it's not biblical. So they deny the Trinity. They are Unitarians, okay? The Unitarian movement, of course, there's a, there's a modern Unitarian movement that um, develops in New England in the 19th century, but this is the original one. Um, there's no connection between the two, I should, I should make, uh, should point out. But, um, but the Italian Unitarians, um, mostly intellectuals, um, um, the ones in Italy are, of course, persecuted. Um, and one of these um, was the Spaniard, Spanish physician, um, Michael Cervantes, who I mentioned at the very beginning, who was the first um, martyr um, burned by Protestants, burned by the Calvinists. So, um, so anyway, to get back to Socinians, his ideas did survive in Poland um, among Polish and Lithuanian nobles. Um, several chose this as the religion of their manners or their, their courts, but um, they, they are generally pushed out in the Thirty Years' War, yeah, 17th century. Um, now, there's a whole other chapter here that, that, that could comprise a whole other lecture, but let me mention these people. There is a group of Reformation radicals who we will define under a different category for one very important reason. Let's call them spiritualists. And I don't mean that they're, they have a Ouija board and they're conjuring the dead or anything. That's the way we use the term spiritualist today. But it means that they go beyond the Bible itself. Okay, and you can see all the others are saying, this is the word, this is where we stop. They believe that people can get revelation directly from God, even people who can't read. Because what does it mean? If someone's illiterate, that they can't go to heaven? Of course they can, is, is their contention. Um, and so the first group that, and again, they grow out of these Anabaptist circles, um, are the, the first of these are the followers of a guy named Kaspar Schwenkfeld, okay? And they're Schwenkfelders, S-C-H-W-E-N-K-F-E-L-D, Schwenkfeld, okay? Um, went so far to assert that the Bible is not the ultimate authority, but that people often do get direct inspiration from God. Often their inner spirit is the term he used. Um, people can get direct revelation. And of course that is mentioned through the Bible, right? But it's extra biblical. Um, and the, he said that the Christian experience is an inner mystical awareness of God's presence. It, it, it begin, the Bible is fine, you can read it, but people can have experiences beyond that. Um, and what it meant for him is that there should be no outward form of worship. Um, that, that w it's of no importance, really. Um, all the sacraments are rejected because they're, none of them are in the, the Bible. Um, even the church itself as an institution is rejected. Um, a physical building, a community of, you know, any community of believers works, because that's the Bible said. Um, and out of this, these ideas, follower, followers of Schwenkfeld form a small congregation um, in Silesia. Um, and by the 18th century, they go with the other Anabaptists to Pennsylvania, the, the, um, not to Lancaster, but to Bucks County, which is right on the border of New Jersey, New Hope, that area, um, where there still survive, I'm pretty sure there's still two congregations of Schwenkfelders left. And, and we'll see that there's, there's a very logical reason why they end up very, very specifically there. Um, but they still survive <laughs> in Pennsylvania um, and um, still believe people can get the inner spirit without, um, without the outer church and no sacraments. Um, one other f um, group of spiritualists from this period um, is uh, the followers of Henrik Nicholas. Um, he was, uh, these are called familists, okay? And I want to mention them just, um, the, or family of love is the, what they're sometimes called, is that they are sort of pantheistic. Um, they um, sometimes are antinomian. Sometimes they are, uh, they don't believe there's anything such as sin or blasphemy. Uh, they believed if God created the world and everything in the world is good. Um, and these leave a little pockets of followers in Germany and the Netherlands and even in England where I think, well, I'll come back to them because the, the familists um, are very interesting. But there's another group I have to throw in here um, because, and, and I think some of this stuff will have sounded familiar, but to tie all these threads together, 
let's think back to the English civil wars um, and revolution when the king is dead, when parliament rules, when there is no established church anymore, and most importantly, there's no censorship of the press. So everyone starts pouring out with these ideas that are um, all over the map, basically, okay? Um, one of the, some of them look more like the Anabaptists um, and they will only baptize adults they come to be called the Baptists, right? There's no connection between those two movements, but ba the Baptist movement is born in those years. Um, John Bunyan, you know, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, was probably a Baptist. But the Baptists themselves actually split into two separate groups. They're the general and the particular Baptists. <laughs> this is, I know, very strange. But it's it, you'll understand what I mean by this, is the general Baptists, like the Anabaptists, believe that everyone can be saved um, regardless of, there's, there's no predestination, general salvation. The particular Baptists are very much like the Calvinists. They believe only a few people are going to get saved and everyone else, and, and they believe in predestination and no free will. The particular Baptists are the ones that dominate, that eventually, 18th century, end up moving from England right to the American South, right? The, the Scots, Irish, and the English, and all the people who settled the South. It's why baptism, the Baptists, um, are, the, are one of the predominant religions in the American South, is that they end up there. But they are particular Baptists. <laughs> not, not in their choice of foods, but I mean, and clothes, but um, in that theologically, they're very much like the Calvinists, okay? They, but they have a different church organization, and of course they have a kind of, you know, church meeting, but no, it's a it's a democratic form of, of government, but um, but they baptize adults. That's what makes them very different from the Calvinists. But as all of this was happening, there were other groups also that came out of the woodwork. And let me mention one specifically, who were antinomian. That means that they believe that God created the world. Everything here is good, and therefore there can be no such thing as sin. There is no original sin. There is no, um, and so these people would do, would swear gloriously in the name of God. And by swear, I mean, I mean, uh, obscenities, <laughs> saying foul things. Um, the, they're called the ranters for a very good reason. And we get the word to rant basically from, from these, these people. Well, the word doesn't come from them, but you, but our associations does is that they would, um, sleep with anyone they wanted, they would drink a lot, smoke in their actual worship services. <laughs> if I ever had to have a religion, I'd be a ranter for, for sure. Um, there is no such thing as sin to them since God is, everything is preordained, um, therefore curse gloriously in the name of God. I think it's, it's an amazing movement, but, but of course they are, they're eventually persecuted. But a, move, but a group that kind of comes out of them, out of these ranters, and there's other ones too. I don't go, go into the seekers and the, but the ones that um, are most fascinating, I think, are the, um, the people that call themselves the Society of Friends. Their detractors call them Quakers because they quake, in, you know, to quake means to, to rumble um, in the name of God. And they end up, um, having a theology that is very, very close to the Anabaptists. Okay, there, again, there's no real connection there, but they, um, the um, Society of Friends are closer to those spiritualists. They're like the Schenkfelders, in that they believe someone can be inspired by the inner spirit directly, um, and that there is no need for sacraments, there's no need for priests, we don't have them, and instead of having a church, we will have a meeting house that's just an ordinary building in which there are two doors so no one goes in first. Men and women are equal. They're pacifists. Again, we think of Quakers, think of the guy on the oat, box of oats is a Quaker. Think of Benjamin Franklin, he was a Quaker. Now, how did all these people get to Pennsylvania is a long story, but William Penn essentially was a colonial settler put there by Charles I when the crown comes is restored back in England after 1660. The... Um, the church is also restored, the English church, and so is the aristocracy, and so is everything. 
And, uh, and then now we can talk really about the Anglican Church, or uh, as we call it in the U.S., the Episcopalian Church, ends up being very, con very conservative. Um, not theologically. Theologically, it's still pretty much Calvinist. But bishops and the trappings and the ornaments and the beautiful churches and everything remain in place in England. But the Quakers are there. And they are, mar the Baptists are marginalized. They go to the New World. The Quakers, um, William Penn, the son of a very important minister ends up um, becoming a Quaker and I think you know it's a long long story but more or less to get rid of this guy the king uh, as a favor to his father gives him this land in Pennsylvania what well, becomes Pennsylvania after after him of course and all the Quakers not all of them actually I shouldn't say all of them most of them just leave but they they and they end up in Pennsylvania um, along with the Anabaptists, along with Jews, were allowed in Pennsylvania too, very interestingly. So Pennsylvania was kind of the, the first open society. Um, and, you know, the radical reformers were consciously invited there. So that's how the Quakers and the Anabaptists end up living side by side, um, is because of that. Um, and the Quakers, of course, still survive in the United States, throughout the United States, and in England also. Um, Jeremy Bentham, you know, they, they, they act, uh, uh, interestingly, in England, they couldn't hold office, uh, in public office, they couldn't go to universities, so they founded their own. Um, this, the University of London is actually a Quaker foundation. Jeremy Bentham, a um, great philosopher, was from there. So, um, but again, the, to get back to the, the Quakers, the, their meetings, Anyone can speak. <laughs> there's no, there's no priest. There's no set liturgy, so that whenever anyone is moved by the inner spirit, men and women, importantly, they just start speaking um, and uh, you know saying what they want. And you know the um, the other very interesting thing, apart from the very simple black dress, is originally Quakers only referred to each other as thee and thou. And the the logic of this is fascinating because you is the formal address to a superior. We speak to God, we say you. Um, we speak to our Lord of the Manor, it's you. Among ordinary people, it's thee and thou. And thee and thou disappeared from English. Now you is everything, right? Um, but they said, since we're all equal, we have to refer to each other as thee and thou. It's kind of like the, the to and vous in French, you know, and, and in other um, romance languages. Um, and they survive and, of course, are very successful, industrious and in business, you know, in, in, in the, both England and the United States. Ben Franklin's the best example. And um, so that's Anabaptism. That's the Radical Reformation. In a nutshell, we have one more talk left, which will be the Catholic Reformation. And I'm using that term intentionally uh, because Catholicism gets a slightly later start in, in its reform, but it, um, it does change the religion very much. Um, and it is the religion that kind of dominates from the Council of Trent, just slightly after all this stuff happens, all the way up to uh, 1964. So we'll come to that next time.